Welcome Chosen Undead to another cynically awesome in-depth look. Today we're going to be looking at the three retail expansions for Dark Souls the board game. This marks the end of all the Dark Souls content currently available and will be available in the foreseeable future. Unless a new season of content comes out, this was everything that was promised in the initial Kickstarter announcement. And these three expansions were exclusive to retail stores. So you have to go out to your local store or buy them online. But we're going to find out today whether or not they're worth getting. Now we're going to look at them in release order. Which means first up we have The Last Giant. Last Giant comes with his behavior cards, his treasure cards, his dial, his model, and of course, his board. First, let's take a look at the model. As you would expect from The Last Giant, this is one of the first, if not the first official boss in Dark Souls 2. And when he came in the box, this pillar was a separate piece that you had to stick on and glue. The model itself, it's fine, you know, again, I'm a bit spoiled when it comes to plastic miniatures, but it's completely serviceable. It looks like what it's supposed to look like. And at the end of the day, when you paint it, you're going to paint it in very dark tones and, you know, it's not going to look like the biggest set piece in the world. And for a mega boss, which this guy is, he's surprisingly small. which I think is pretty interesting. He's got his dial, he's got 44 health, whatever. He's got these treasures, which are kind of whatever as well because mega bosses don't really, unless you're doing a campaign rather, that's the only time these treasures would ever come into play. But if you're not doing a campaign, the mega boss is the last enemy you'll face at the end of a full session or full mini campaign, whatever you want to call it. Because you're supposed to go mini boss, main boss, mega boss, and then game's over. Congratulations. We've got the last giant here and he has his level four encounters because he is a proper mega boss. And of course his behavior deck. Now he has, like all the other mega bosses out there, a bit of a gimmick. Now, I don't say gimmick in a bad context here. I say gimmick as in every mega boss behaves a bit differently than just a standard boss encounter. Because this guy, without spoiling it too much, if you're familiar with how the game played out, this guy, when I, I assume everyone who cares about Dark Souls the board game, has played or at least seen Dark Souls the video game. And this guy... When you fight him, he's a big lumbering giant. He does his big swings with his hands. And then midway through the fight, he tears off his own hand. Now the question is, is that faithfully recreated in the card game? Or rather the board game? And again, without spoiling all the different behavior cards, we have five standard behaviors, five arm behaviors, one, two, three, four, five heat up cards, and then this special card here, uh, a slam card. When we set up his deck, we take three random standard behavior cards here and three arm behavior cards here. These are cards that the giant does because he still has an arm. So we put this together to make our first behavior deck. Now when he heats up, as in he gets to half health, which is actually depicted here for some reason, not half health, it's 18 health for him for some reason. Woo, that's a lot of health to get through. Yeah, right there at 18, he heats up, which means we add the slam behavior card in here. We remove the three arm cards because he no longer has an arm. He's going to rip it off.
and then three heat up cards. Shuffle this all up and this will be the new behavior deck. So as you can imagine, without even spoiling the card, you can tell what he's gonna do, right? His attacks may initially be short range, swiping at different players. And then when he heats up, he now has a slam, which is a much wider range. He tears off his arm, which means he has longer reach and that faithfully recreates the fight. But not only that, he has this icon on some of his behavior cards, which is a wind up. When you see this icon, any character can spend a stamina to move one node. You see him winding up for a big swing and you have the opportunity to move out of the way. So it's a pretty faithfully recreated fight. And something that I personally like, and I'm sure someone worked very hard on, is the board. This here is his boss room. And this is actually very faithfully recreated from the video game because you fight him in this kind of like cave room that's not terribly big. So I thought this was neat. Although the level four encounter area here, this does not look like the area outside of his boss room. So kind of disappointed in that. Then again, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's not the area outside his boss room. I'm pretty sure it was more of a ruinous structure. Anywho, verdict on the last giant. The fight itself, in terms of the board game, it's another mega boss fight. If you're really a big fan of Dark Souls 2, it's a faithful recreation. Is it the most interesting fight? Is he the most interesting or cool looking boss? Uh, the verdict's out on that. Personally, I don't think so. Um, lore arguments aside, I mean, look at him. If you knew nothing about Dark Souls, you see this guy and you're kind of like, eh, okay, he's a big thing. You know, it's not the coolest thing in the world. But other than that, I would say put him later on your list of things to get if you're really trying to get all the content. But if you're like me and you're trying to get all the content, you're going to get him anyways. Who cares if he's cool or not? Because you got to have him. I mean, am I right or am I right? Moving right along, the next one on our list here is the Executioner's Chariot, also from Dark Souls 2. And this was a more of an iconic fight. But not only does this expansion come with our Executioner's Chariot, which is two separate models here, and no, I don't recommend gluing them together, not only is it your standard treasure, dial, boss and behavior cards, and you know, level four encounters, it's also some new monsters in the form of skeletons and black hollow mages. If you remember this fight, this is what we call a gimmick and an ad fight. And I'm talking about in the video game. So how does that get recreated here? Well, let me tell you. These are the level four encounters. We can set these aside. We got ourselves the executioner's chariot here. And on the other side, we got ourselves a skeletal horse. It's literally the two separate models here. Or the boss. So you fight one in the one stage and the other in the other stage. So we've got all these skeletal horse behavior cards. And as if you notice, we've got three heat up cards and all these behaviors. Okay. So that leaves this. This is the death race. Now this will only make sense, or at least will be a better visual indication if I show you the board. Let's check it out. Now his board is a bit bigger.
we got ourselves here a death arena. Now this is pretty freaking cool. Here is his spawn point, which means he'll be here with the horse. Both of them take up the one space. And this isn't a standard fight, or at least not a standard boss fight. When the fight begins, he actually has a mega boss set up here for this room, which means you'll also be using these skeletons. You place them around the map, as well as these hollow mages. So, just like in the video game, this is an ad fight. After that's set up, instead of setting up the behavior deck, you do the Executioner's Chariot, which is made up of the four Death Race cards. Now, when you set this up, you set it up with four at the bottom and one at the top. So four, three, two, one, just like that that will be our starting behavior deck. When the fight actually begins, you'll set up his real behavior deck, which will consist of one, two, three, four standard cards, and then one heat up card. Shuffle this deck, put it off to the side. You'll need that after you finish the death race. So at the very beginning of the fight, we're fighting the executioner's chariot. You notice here he's got no health signifier. And he's got a special condition. When all the black hollow mages and skeletons have been defeated, the chariot is removed from the board and the skeletal horse heats up. So that means the rider here dies and instead you're fighting the horse once all these guys are set and gone. So how does a death race work? Well, it's kind of like the fire breathing mega bosses that we've seen previously where they had a separate deck just like this and when you flipped it they kind of jumped off the map and then breathed fire and specific sections he does a similar thing except if i mean all, all the context clues are here what do you think he's going to do he's going to run in round in this circle as you can see It'll tell you where to place him. So if we're looking at it from this angle, we'll place him in this node and then damage these four nodes here. Damage them for seven damage. One dodge. So he's gonna go around in a circle and it's not really much of a spoiler because I mean, it's self-explanatory. He's gonna keep going around in a circle and that's what the death race cards are. And of course, once this deck is over, he's just gonna keep going around in circles, going around in circles. And the cool thing is, you see these little pockets? You can actually hide in these pockets, just like in the video game. I think this is one of the most interesting and faithfully recreated fights that is translated so well into this board game. And then, like I said, once these guys are dead, the rider goes away. And then you fight the horse with the behavior deck you set aside. And then it's like any other boss fight that you've done up to this point. Instead of fighting the executioner chariot, you now fight the skeletal horse. And then he has his standard fair abilities, so on and so forth. And he doesn't heat up after this because that was essentially his heat up. I think this is cool. But not only that, these monsters can be added into other adventures. And to do that, you simply decide whether or not you want to add these guys at the start of your adventure. Similar to like how you add the other encounters, you simply take their matching level one, level two, level three encounter cards and add them to whatever pile of encounter cards you're already using. I actually didn't bring up the cards here, but there is another small stack of level one, level two, level three encounters, which will have these guys on there as monsters that you can now encounter. The Black Hollow Mage also introduces a new ability here in the form of this icon, 
which is the raise skeleton behavior. When it activates, if there are currently fewer enemies in the encounter with the word skeleton in their name than there were at the start of the encounter, then you choose one of those defeated skeleton enemies and place them on the closest enemy spawn node. Just like in the video game, these guys are a pain to deal with because they're constantly spawning skeletons. So in terms of content to the game, this one adds a lot, not just in the level one, two, three encounters, but also in how unique this boss fight is. It's one of my favorites. But enough about Dark Souls 2, because quite frankly, Dark Souls 2 is the worst out of all of them. And sorry for those people out there who prefer Dark Souls 2 over the other ones. You're wrong, it's okay to be wrong. Now I wouldn't be so bold as to say there is a objective best one, however I can objectively say Dark Souls 2 is the weakest. But enough about that, let's get to the last expansion, and that would be Manus, Father of the Abyss. This guy is not only the last retail expansion, the last expansion for Dark Souls the board game, but he is also the last boss you fight in Dark Souls 1 with the DLC. In the video game, he is one of the coolest fights in a sense that a lot happens in that fight. I'm not going to spoil it, but it's a very unforgettable fight for one reason or another. But let's look at what the expansion brings. So we've got his treasure cards, his character card, his behavior cards, heat up cards, level four encounter cards, a dial, and his board. So, unfortunately though, and I hate to kind of start the in-depth look with an unfortunately, but it's a pretty big unfortunately. Again, not to spoil the video game, but it's a very cinematic fight. And there is a gimmick in that fight that's not recreated here in the board game. Not that I want it to, because that gimmick kind of sucked, but everything that that fight was in the video game is what made up that boss's experience. And what a boss he is, because look at him. He is a big, big boy. Just to kind of put it into perspective here, this is a skeleton. It's about the size of an adventurer. Yeah, he's kind of big. He's not the biggest boss. Definitely not the biggest boss by any means. Although he does come in the biggest box. But I think that's because he's literally one piece. One piece! Uh, and I mean that as in like there's no gluing or assembling that needed to be done like there did with, say, the gaping dragon. Uh, so. And he's, he's just so damn cool. Look at him. Yeah. He's going to be a lot of fun to paint. And I might even, well, I was going to say I might push him to the top of my painting list, but I'm not going to do that. I have other things I want to do. But let's, let's, so let's look at this fight, right? Normally, when you look into these books here, there is a part where it says setting up the boss and it's going to talk about any gimmicks that he has. And the thing is, he doesn't, really have any. When you set up his fight, he's got nine behavior cards and five heat up cards. You take five of these behavior cards, one, two, three, four, five, boom, and that will be his behavior deck starting off. Once he heats up, you take one heat up card, place it on top of the, the behavior deck. So I guess that's different about him. For example, let's say you have these five cards and you beat him on, say, the third card, right? Now, normally, when a boss heats up, you take a heat up card and then you shuffle them all together. Here, you don't do that. Here, instead, you take the heat up card, put it on top of the deck, then take another heat up card 
and put it face up on the bottom without looking at it. And then you keep going. There's no reshuffling that happens. You've just added two new behavior cards. So that's different, but I wouldn't say that's interesting. You know what I mean? Another thing we'll see on his cards here is that he has this icon, which is the zero range icon, which means he can't hit people in zero range because he's a big boy, he slams down, but whenever he attacks, he kind of hits people out of his reach. So if you're directly under him, he won't hit you. And that's what that card is saying. So it's, it's, a, it's not a new icon, it's one that players have as well. Um, when they have uh, like spear weapons, they can't hit somebody that's in zero range. And I think bows have it as well. You can't hit somebody that's on your node. You have to take a step back, then shoot them or hit them. Another thing, his ability here, overextended, after he activates, character may spend one stamina to move one node. So it's kind of like how the last giant had the wind up but the windup was on his behavior cards. He just has that throughout his entire fight because his arm here like stretches out like um, Fantastic Four and then it takes time to come back together. And also he's, you know, he's a sorcerer. He's got this big catalyst and his spells take time to um, charge up and then shoot out and then he recovers. So throughout the entire fight, you can spend a stamina to move a node. So you can use that to get closer, although it does cost a stamina, but you might recover it at the start of your turn. That's it though, that, that, that's it. That's all there is to his fight. Uh, it's not the most interesting thing I would say. Although what I will say as an interesting point of note here, his board comes in a different size. Normally, prior to this expansion, boards came in two sizes. The bigger, longer rectangles, and then the squares. These were the only two sizes. And now this comes out, and it's smaller. It's more compact. And if we were to stretch this, or unfold this out now you know his fight did take place in a very cramped area so accurate but if we'd also take a look at this right this is the last giant's room same same size so what the hell guys why did you just now discover how to Save space. What, what, come on, what is that about? Interesting, cool, accurate, although not the most interesting fight and is missing the interesting, gimmicky, cinematic moments of the video game. But I guess you can't win them all, even though everything else about this expansion I like. Honestly, I do. It's just that it's not totally faithful to the video game. And that leaves a, a taste in my mouth. But I'm sure whatever I say, unless I said that he was awful, unless I said the model was terrible, unless I said it would give you cancer, you would still go out and get it because it's freaking manis, dude. It's Manus of the Abyss. Really. You're, if you're looking for a reason to not get it, you're not going to find it here. I'm not telling you to go and get it. I'm just not giving you a reason to not get it. Get what I'm saying? But yeah, those are the three retail expansions for Dark Souls, the board game. What do you think of these expansions? Have you found them in your local retailers? or are they sold out? I'm genuinely curious to know, but that's all for now. And thanks for your continued support.